verse 5 through 7. And when you arrive there, say amen. If you're waiting for the screen, I think it just came up. Amen. And the word of God says, And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. We're going to go ahead and move now into the book of Isaiah. We have a few verses to read there, starting in chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. I'll give you a second to get there in your Bibles. The word of the Lord reads, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Thou, Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. And thy comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy. Everybody say joy. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Amen. Why don't you put your Bible down and go with me to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this word. Amen. Ask him to anoint your ears that you might hear what thus saith the Lord this morning out of his word. God, we've come to your house this morning and search God for a fresh touch. I ask right now that you would open the ears and the hearts and minds of every single person under the sound of my voice. Lord, that they would receive what it is that you have for them this morning. God, let your word go forth with an, uh, authority and anointing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to preach a little bit this morning on the thought of when Abraham's altar became Jacob's well. As you read through the book of Genesis, obviously one of the first characters you come across is the father of the faithful, and that is Abraham. God began to move upon Abraham's heart and called him out of his homeland, called him out of Ur, the Chaldees, and the area that he was called out of was given to idolatry. They were idol worshipers. And God had promised Abraham that if he would leave his homeland, that he would show him a new land and that he would make a great nation out of Abraham. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God has called me into something greater than what this world has to offer. I'm glad that he's called us, amen, as a group, as a corporate group, out of something that this world had promised us us that would have never come true. So I'm glad that he is calling us to be something greater than what we would have been had we not met him. A new name, if you will, and into a new place. When God had called Abraham, God had gave him several promises. And he said, I will bless thee. And then he said, I will bless them that bless thee. And in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's a pretty hefty promise right there. But if you continue reading through your Bible, you find that out of Abraham's bloodline came the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So that promise too was also made good on. And the greatest blessing that the world had ever received came out of his bloodline. So Abraham enters into the promised land, and as Abraham began to go in, the Lord began to talk to him. And if you remember, the first thing that God had talked to him about Abraham was, I'm going to show you a land. But as he came into that land, he came into a place called Sikkim. And it was at Sikkim that God confirmed to Abraham all the promises that he had given him before. God had told Abraham before that when you arrive in Canaan, I'm going to show you the land. But as he arrived in Canaan, God changed that to, this is the land that your seed will inherit. You see, God never 
over promises and under delivers, but he always over delivers his promises. Amen. When you get to a place where God gives you his promise and he delivers that promise to you, you'll find that it's not just what you expected, but it goes above and beyond what you had ever imagined. Can I get a witness in the house this morning? And so... Conversely, you can play the role of what if Abraham had rejected God's plan for his life? Let's say that Abraham was comfortable where he was because when God called him, the Bible says that it was amongst his kin. His family was there. His father was there. His mother was there. And we all know that typically churches are congregated of them that are related to one another. My sister goes to that church. My brother goes to that church. Or my husband believes in that religion. And so therefore, I kind of default in believing in that religion. So we know that it took faith for Abraham to decide to believe in God. It took faith for Abraham to believe that, that God was going to make good on his promises. What I find interesting is that it was after God made good on his promise that Abraham decided to build an altar. It wasn't before. A lot of times we talk about worshiping through your problem. Worshiping till you get your blessing. Worshiping and then you're going to get a breakthrough. But in this case, Abraham moved based upon faith. And then when God said, it's your seed that will inhabit this land one day, Abraham said, I'm going to build an altar of worship right here. It's interesting because again, it's, it's sort of against the grain. It's not the norm. But I think what Abraham understood that we sometimes don't understand is that while God provides a promise, there is more to come. There is more that's on its way. You see, Abraham was satisfied with the promise that God had given him, but he knew that with God comes bigger and greater things. And so why not start worshiping after your promise has been given for the next promise? Why not start worshiping now, even though you may have already received something in the past you decide right after that promise has been delivered this is where I'm going to build my altar of worship for the next promise that's coming down the line I don't know about you but I'm not satisfied with just the the normal uh, here and there blessing but I want it to be a continuous flow and so therefore my altars have to be continuously built an altar is a place of death it's a place of sacrifice, and it's, it is interesting that at the delivery of a promise that Abraham would simply decide that he would go ahead and sacrifice something and put it to death and deliver that unto God as a sacrifice of praise. But you see, he understood that it is an earthly gain to gain the land of Canaan. Now, the land of Canaan was a highly desired place. It was sort of like maybe getting a house in Pasadena or San Marino. It was a, a highly desired place. And I'm just trying to give you something that you might be able to relate to. But see, again, when Abraham received that, that, that promise in Hebrews 11.10, it says that Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. I'm not interested in earthly foundations. I'm not interested in material things that this world can only offer me that gives temporal happiness. I'm interested in a foundation that God would build through my sacrifice and a foundation that only he can lay in my life. And that's what the Bible says that Abraham was looking for. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Amen. When we receive blessings that God has delivered unto us, and I believe that he has done so, delivered material items such as a car or maybe a bonus at the job. Or, and I believe that God is in the details of things. I believe that he cares about the desires of your heart and he cares about what matters to you such as your family, uh, your your your, your well-being and, and your livelihood. He cares about all of that. So we serve a God that cares about us. Amen. But while he gives us material things in this world, let us not stop worshiping after the delivery of that item. Let's not say, you know what? This is good enough. I'm satisfied with my new car. I'm satisfied with my new job. And doesn't my Michael Kors purse look real nice? No, no, no. What he's saying is that's just the adding on top. That's just the cream on the top. But if you dig deeper, if you go deeper in me, and if your sacrifices become greater, 
later. You do not understand what promises I have in store for you. This is just the surface. This is just the stuff that I give you on the side. Amen. Am I making sense to anybody here? You see, the picture that God sees is so much grander than what we see. We're sometimes satisfied with our house and our two cars, and, and that's the American dream. And we're satisfied making a good wage, and we go to work faithfully, and we give our time, and we punch the clock. And we're never late because we want to give a good impression, as we should as a Christian. But that's not pleasing to God as it is coming to church and, and building an altar of praise and sacrifice. Would you decide that work is enough and you're satisfied that's telling God I have all that I need from you you just remain at bay when I need you all call you I'm talking about altars of sacrifice and praise and I believe that that is what Abraham understood because even though the land of lands the land that was flowing with milk and honey was literally delivered and promised to him he decided to build an altar it seems that modern day religion frowns on any type of sacrificial worship that doesn't feel good we don't need to talk about the blood we don't need to talk about the crucifixion and the pain that he was that he suffered and was afflicted with we don't need to talk about anything that makes us uncomfortable we don't need to touch on my personal life and my relationships I just come to church that that's outside of the walls of this building I don't need a preacher to dabble in my relationships and I just want to serve God the way that I want to serve him and I just want to be comfortable in my approach God should accept the way that my sacrifice to him is just because that's the way I feel comfortable in doing it. And I believe that many mainstream Christians today chalk up sacrificial worship as unnecessary and fanatical and over exuberant and even extreme. Well, I can care less what they call it because as long as it pleases my God, as long as the worship and whatever I do when I run around the building, when I dance for joy, when I'm up here shouting and nobody else is, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. All that matters is that my sacrifice of worship pleases my God and if it causes him to move and if it causes him to act on my behalf then so be it. Then let it be done because I am so desiring to put to worship and to praise God they've turned their altars into a place of blessing it's a place where we can come and throw our wallets down on the altar and and just not really have any commitment but ask for God to bless us financially or ask for things from God it's come a place where we can congregate together and give each other compliments now I'm not talking bad about all of that I believe that if you have faith and there's action behind that faith that God will respond to those cries and and he works through the well-being of his saints and the character of us but I just kind of feel like mainstream Christianity has painted the altars with a false brush and they're making it seem as though it's it's unnecessary but I can't find anywhere in the Bible where a blessing came from the altar without a sacrifice being placed on that altar there's nowhere in the Word of God where you'll find somebody approach the altar empty-handed and and half-hearted where God said just because you showed up at the altar I've decided to bless you no 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 you understand that before God moves we have to move before God acts on your behalf you have to find an altar and say God my situation is drawing me to a place where I am going to build an altar of praise amen how many Holy Ghost worshipers do I have in the house today is this too extreme for anybody amen am I hitting a nerve I think he's looking for somebody that says I'm not wanting just feel-good worship and I'm looking for a commitment is what God is saying this morning he's looking for somebody who will serve him and will be committed to him in a serious manner you see Sechem was also mentioned that was the place that Abraham had built that altar it was also mentioned in his grandson's life, Jacob. In Genesis 33, 18, we are told that Jacob came to Sechem and there he built another altar. 
You see, the practice of altar building was passed down from generation to generation. It didn't stop with Abraham, but he passed the practice down from generation to generation. And our children need to be taught a lot of things. They need to go to school, and they, they should go after a higher education, and, and they should aspire to do great things. But one thing that they should absolutely be taught is how to build an altar to God. It's how to come to an altar and to give themselves to God and to build a relationship. They need to find a place of prayer that they can have communion with God one on one. A place where they fall in love with their Savior. A place where they come face to face with God and learn not religion but relationship. This is a place, yes, where they will die to self will but they will fall in love with the Savior that cares for their soul. Yeah. Hallelujah. The altar is a place. Shatoro Maha. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost in this house this morning. The altar is a place of direction. And only certain direction will be given at this altar. If you're in the house this morning and you're seeking direction, you're seeking a better way, you're trying to find how to serve God, can I tell you that all direction comes from the altar? You, you can't bypass this place up here, but we had better become to love and to cherish the altar. T.F. Tinney, one of today's greatest Pentecostals in my mind, T.F. Tinney once said something that was so impacting to me. He said, we teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. You see, our children are going to imitate what we do. They're going to become what you are, not what you say to do. If we bypass the altar, then they will bypass the altar. If we don't, if we don't value what happens at this altar, then they will never value the, the transition and the power and the, the peace that this altar brings in their life. They'll never learn the power of sacrifice. They'll never learn to embrace it. So if we don't practice sacrificial giving, if we don't practice sacrificial prayer and sacrificial living, then how could we ever expect that they would practice that? How can we ever expect them to do things that we don't do? We need to imitate what, what God has called us to do so that way they will follow our direction. Amen. If we pray, they're going to pray. If we worship, they're going to worship. There's a lot of times when I'm up here worshiping and it's not because I just kind of have an extra burst of energy or I just kind of feel like it. A lot of times I worship not, not just for me, but I worship for my kids and for your kids and for you to set an example that yes, there are times when we come to the house of God that we don't feel it. I, I, I may have a headache. I may be sick. I may not even want to be here, but my worship is not for you to see necessarily but it's for me to tell God, God, I'll give you all that I got. No matter my feeling, no matter what I think, it's for you. And it's also for your kids. Yes. Amen. If we trust in God, then our kids are going to learn to trust and to rely on God's unchanging hand. I'm not looking for my kids to just remember that every day of the life or most days they came to church. I mean, we're here almost all the time. I have a secular job. I work a full-time job, but I'm blessed to be able to work remotely and have that flexibility. But my kids are pretty much here all the time. I mean, when I come, they come. I'm talking about Monday and Tuesday when, when everybody else is off in the summer. We come down here and I'm not griping. I'm not saying anything bad about it. But what I am saying is I'm not looking for my kids just to have a memory of, oh, when I was growing up, my parents drug me to the church every time they had the opportunity. That's not what I'm looking for. You see, the altar that I'm building when I find myself here faithfully for God, working for God, the altar that I am exemplifying is an altar that says blessing occurs at the church. This is where we receive direction. This is where we have safety. This is where our soul is saved. This is where we learn how to worship. This is where there are people around us in our circle
people that influence us and influence my kids. That's why it's so important that you would live for God with all your heart. Because not only are your kids watching, but my kids are watching you. And if they see a people who build altars because they love God, not just because he is God, but because of a relationship they have with God, then they will be, they will be drawn in to build that same altar. And they will grow up with a relationship with God. That's why I do what I do. I don't get paid for coming down here every single time I come down here. I'm not looking for a paycheck, but rather it is a joy because I know what my future holds. I know the promises that await me beyond that blue. I know that when I get to heaven, God is going to look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful. Thou good and faithful. You see, faithful is the key word here. You have to be faithful to the house of God why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now for how good he is and how good he's gonna be generation to generation you had Abraham Isaac and Jacob and so Joseph was Jacob's son who was second found, found himself second in command of all of Egypt and who all in, in, in all of his prestige and, and all of his wealth and fame he didn't request to be buried with the kings of the land I mean it would be an honor to be buried with royalty and to be put with a tombstone so big that everybody would remember you but the Bible says that he had one request upon his death and he desired to be buried in the land of his fathers in Joshua 24 32 it says in the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt buried they in Shechem and in a parcel of the ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor the father of Shechem for an hundred pieces of silver and and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. The altar became an inheritance. Why would anybody want to inherit a dirty altar? Why would anybody want to inherit an altar that is stained with blood and the stench of death? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, they all knew that God is divinely attracted to altars. He is drawn. There is something about the commitment of sacrifice at an altar that God absolutely cannot resist. He's not impressed with our churches. He's not impressed with our temples. When we add money into this church and we decide to upgrade, it's not to enhance the presence of God. It's not to further that presence or, or make it even more potent. It's for us to be comfortable. We have air conditioning today. I thank God for the air conditioning. Amen. That's a blessing. We can worship and not walk out of here sopping. We have comfortable chairs that we can sit in. I can use a microphone and not blow out my voice every time I preach. We invest in online media so that way we can reach our world and our circle. But the money that we invest in this church is not so that the presence of God would be more potent or more prevalent in this place. He's not impressed with that. He's simply looking for someone to decide that I want to find myself faithful in the presence of a living God. I was looking for someone to decide that no matter what I do today, I have to make it down to the house of God. I have an altar to build. I have a God to please. If I do anything else in this day, you will find me in the house of God. He's simply looking for someone to decide to heap one dirty stone upon another dirty stone or one dirty part of their life upon another dirty part of their life until they have erected an altar in their life and then God will break forth and recognize the humble efforts of a dirty person and their soul that needs the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost and then when he finds them at the altar exposing all of their dirt uh, 
metaphorically, he acts upon that decision. And he comes down and he fills them with the Holy Ghost and washes and regenerates them and changes their life. Can I be honest with you today? I think the awe of that has kind of worn off for some of us. I think we're kind of used to the idea of having forgiveness when we need it. We become accustomed to the ability to walk in here at times not really respecting the presence of what we feel in here but we've come accustomed and comfortable to walk in here and then walk out never visiting the altar never making a commitment never growing in our walk with God never challenging ourselves, but simply satisfied because on Sunday I went to church May we never become satisfied with simply coming to church. Amen. Let us never get, let us never become satisfied with just coming to church and never finding your place and never building an altar in church that you can give to God and say, God, this altar's for you. My prayer life, my worship, it's for you, God. And through that, you're going to do great things. Let me take a moment here and talk about decisions. One moment in time. One decision can literally alter the rest of your life. If you can, remember back with me in your life. The time that you decided that you wanted to serve God. The time that you decided that an altar is worth the cost. Remember back to the filling of euphoria, the feeling of bliss when you felt the presence of God for the first time and you literally wanted to tell everybody about it. Remember back to that when no matter what was preached and no matter what the pastor asked of you, not only did you do that, but you were knocking on his door saying, what else can I do? What else is required of me? What can I do to get more of this in my life? Those were altars that you built once upon a time. Those were altars that changed your life and decisions that you made to build that altar that you will never be the same because even if you walk out of this church today, you will always look back at this point in your life and you will long to be in this church. I'm talking about altars and decisions that you made in your life. It was a moment in time, a, a, a single decision that you made that literally altered the rest of your life and your thought process. You see, one of the decisions that I made in my life a long time ago, which just so happens to be one of the best decisions I ever made, and that was to marry my beautiful wife. You can say woo, that's okay. <laughs> That's appropriate. From that decision, from that decision right there, I have received happiness in ways that I can't put into words. I've received three beautiful children that I have the joy and the honor of raising. It is souls that God has placed in my life under my care, under my direction. And so I had better make sure that my decision to build an altar is one that is final. I cannot waver on the altar that I need to build so that I can model that not only to my wife, whom I love dearly and I care about her soul, but that altar needs to be representative to them that this is a place that you will always remember that is of supreme importance in your life. The decision that I made back then completely changed me as a person and it was ordained by God. Which means that no matter what comes our way, because God has put us together and we stand upon the promise of making it through, no matter what comes our way, we're going to make it through it. We're going to make it through it. As long as we keep God in the center and we plant our feet firm upon the foundation of the rock. We're going to make it through it. Amen. 
The only other decision that trumps that was the decision that I had made at a young age. It was a decision that was firm in my mind and it was in my mind non-negotiable. It was the most important decision that I had ever made in my life. It was to serve God. It was to serve God with everything that I had. That means that there wouldn't be any areas of my life that I would say, God, Lord, I'm going to serve you with almost everything I have. I mean, you can have my time. I'll give you my time. You, you can have a lot of different things, but don't touch my finances. No. My finances are mine. You're... You, no, I'll serve you. I'll be faithful. I'm going to come to the house of God and I'm going to love like you had called me to love and forgive like you want me to forgive. There's a lot of things I'll do for you, God. But that's off limits. I, I just sort of picked that out of the air. I, I could use relationships. I could use friends. I can, I can use a lot of different scenarios to, to utilize and to strengthen my point. But can I tell you that when I made the decision to serve God, it was an altar that I built, that I built, that I did not leave out a piece, but I put everything inside of me, everything that mattered, I placed on that altar and building and constructing it because I knew it was an altar that would not only last me a lifetime, but it would last me an eternity. I knew that it mattered not today, not just today, and not just yesterday, but it matters for tomorrow, and it matters for eternity. It's an altar that's going to matter forever. Yeah. 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 And I decided a long time ago that if nobody else does it, if nobody else wants to join me in building an altar like that, that I'm going to continue in the building of that altar. That I, I'm going to be around if nobody else decides to serve God. If, if pastor decides not to, which highly is unlikely, but let's say he decides not to. If you decide not to, you're going to find me faithfully serving God and building an altar in this church because it's not about you. I love you. I want your soul to be saved. I care for you. I, I care for the decisions that you make for not only just you but for your kids but can I tell you that I'm more important to God than just anyone out there in my eyes in my life what I do matters to God and God cares about my soul and so therefore if I'm going to please him I have to please him with everything inside of me it's my actions that I'm going to be called on not yours if you leave church, I can't tell God, well, you know, brother so-and-so left church and I just got so discouraged. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to follow. No, no, God has not called us to be followers. God has called us to lead those who are lost. God has called us to lead our children in serving him. He's called us to be an example. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now? The decision that I made to serve God would ultimately guide every one of the hundreds of thousands of decisions that I would make for the rest of my life. You see, when you decide to serve God and you're born again, you are born into a new kingdom. You're not of this world. And that's exactly what Abraham was saying when he decided to build an altar after the promise had been received and delivered. He was saying, you know what, this is good, but there is another world that I need to get to. There's something more important. And that's how it is when we come to God and we decide to serve him. We say, God, I'm going to serve you and I'm committed to you. And so your life changes. How many's life has changed since you've come to God? Amen. This single decision right here is going to change who you marry. If you're not married yet, it's going to change who your children are going to be in their future. This decision is going to change your circle of friends. Amen? Yeah. This decision is going to change where you decide to buy a house and where you decide to plant yourself in the workforce. This decision is going to ultimately change where I would spend eternity. The happiest moments of my life have been because of this single decision. 
I don't have to worry about what I did last night because I was coherent. I don't have to worry about losing my job tomorrow because of something stupid I did. I don't have to worry about what my wife is up to. I don't have to question her and her faithfulness to me. I know that her altar is firm. I know her decision has been made. I don't have to worry about it because our trust together is placed in God. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to stay up at night wondering what's going to happen. If I lose my job tomorrow, this decision gave me stability. If I get in a car, a car wreck this afternoon, I don't have to worry about the outcome because that decision right there already decided that I'm going to be victorious in whatever it is I do. I don't have to worry about it. Because when you decide to serve God and you come down here and you built an altar to God and you say, God, this is the altar in which I'm going to glorify you with. He recognizes that and say, because you have blessed me, I will bless you. Because of your sacrifice, I will make sure that whatever you put your hands to, that it will be successful. I will make sure that no matter what happens in your life, that you will have peace. Amen. Amen. Everything I have today that's worth anything of value has come from the decision of building this altar. I'm talking about my church family. I'm talking about my family. I'm talking about my friends. I'm talking about my ministry. I'm talking about my salvation. Everything of value that I have ever received in this life has been delivered right here at this altar. Has it been easy? No. Have I gone through some rough patches? Absolutely. Have I questioned my faith? You better believe it. I believe that if you've not yet questioned your faith, there will come a day when God is going to try you in a place in your life where you're going to question whether or not building this altar is worth it. And you had better decide that no matter what comes your way, God, I may not feel you today. I may not have felt your presence for a week. I may feel like you've put me on despair. I may feel like you left me on the scene without, without a, a flow. But I'm telling you right now, no matter what comes my way, I have decided to serve God. I have decided to be faithful. I have decided to be saved. I have decided to show up. Mm. And the only reason why I made that decision is because somebody before me decided that they were going to build an altar. And one of them today is no longer with us. But can I tell you that her altar is still in place. Uh, that her prayers are still in place. Uh, it is because of that altar and the altar that my dad built a long time ago. You see, it was a decision that they made. Uh, yeah, they could have been ran off a long time time ago with all the life trials that they had gone through but you understand that stability of future comes from the present building of an altar it comes from a place that you say God I'm building this altar not just for today but for tomorrow I still receive strength from that altar I still receive stability from that altar. Parents, I'm talking to you. If you've not yet picked it up, I'm talking to you and I'm telling you that you had better build an, an altar. You don't want to get to a place in your life where you wonder why your kids think the way they think. Uh, and you wonder why your kids do things that what they do. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you had build, better build an altar early on in their life uh, where this is not a foreign place, uh, but it's a place that we visit often. Uh, it's a place where we receive direction and love from God. Amen. Draw strength from the altar. Can we just raise our hands right now and begin to praise him? Come on, church. We're in the house of God this morning. Can we entertain his presence? Can we begin to talk to him right now? Come on, don't give up so soon. Don't be distracted about who's around you or what they're doing. But begin to focus your mind on God. Talk to him and let him know, God, today is the day that I'm deciding. Today is the day, God, that I'm building an altar in my life. Today is the day. The altar that I build today will become a well spring of life for a future generation.
the place that you sit today. The sacrifices and the benefits that you enjoy today, you may not have had to sacrifice for. You may not have paid the price for what you enjoy in this building. There's been a lot of decisions made in this building that hurt, it cost a lot. There's people that have gone before you that have paved the way with altars of stability and decisions that they've made that aren't here today. They're gone. But you can sit in a church building where somebody else paid the price and they helped pay the mortgage and the presence of God that we so freely feel in this place. And the reason why we're here is because there have been people that have gone on before you that have built altars and made decisions in their life. They've decided that this is the most important place in my life. Jobs, they come and go. Family, they may leave you. Faithful friends may decide tomorrow they're not gonna be faithful. People run after a lot of things. They run after money, women, men. These are all temporal things. What I'm talking about today is a decision to build an altar that will impact tomorrow. I'm talking about the decision that you make right now. When your mind, you're contemplating, am I going to do this? Is this the day? Can I do this? The altar that I draw strength from today was built by somebody who's not here. I may never even know. There could have been somebody before that prayed for you and all the future saints of this church. You may not ever get to meet them. You may not ever get to thank them. You may never get to hug their neck and say, you know what, because of what you did, the decisions you made in this church and you helped this church go. There was a time when this church was, was on the verge of being lost to the banks. There was a time when we almost lost this building and we would have been kicked out. There was a time when we went through financial hardship. A lot of you in this building don't remember that. You weren't here. But there were people here that paid that price. They built an altar. They made that decision that it's worth it. It wasn't worth it for them. They didn't get to enjoy the benefit this long, but it was worth it for the future. After Joseph's life, Shechem is mentioned a whole lot in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, this special place of sacrifice was only mentioned one time. Remember, this is where Abraham built an altar. This was the altar that after he had received the blessing that he decided it was time to worship. So he built an altar in Shechem. Thousands of years later, literally, in the New Testament, this special place of sacrifice and worship is only mentioned one time. Even after many have forgotten about Abraham's altar. In John 4, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and parted again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. You see, the disciples that were following Jesus didn't understand it. But Jesus was saying, I have an appointment. I have an appointment in Sychar that has been thousands of years in the making. It was an altar that was built by Abraham, the bloodline in which I came. In verse 5 it says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. You see, over the course of all that time in between, God had been doing something in Sychar that nobody had known about. 
lot of people had forgotten about that altar that was built by Abraham. In the New Testament, not a whole lot of people went by there. But there was something inside Jesus that said, I have to go pay a, a visit. One of the first sacrifices that ever was made. God had transformed the altars of sacrifice in that area. The altars of sacrifice and consecration and dedication. He had transformed those altars into wells. Springs of life. You see, an altar is a place of death and sacrifice. But a well, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. A well gives life. An altar takes life. After Abraham built his, al his altar, his place of death where he went on to be, to obtain his promise, the altar that he built became a memorial of worship. The altar that you build today will become a memorial of worship that will be looked upon back by you, not just for stability, but forever th for others who need to draw strength from that. Amen. Why don't you stand this morning as I come to a close? If you have family in this house today, I would ask that you would gather with them around the front of the church this morning. Amen. Everybody in the building, if you would come to the front of the building and congregate with your families this morning, I'd like to pray. I'd like to have a special prayer over your family. I know we're approaching 12 noon here pretty quick, but we have nothing else to do after this but have fun. Amen. If you are in here today and you have family here, I'd like you to come up. If you don't have family, still come up, please. that Abraham built. Abraham was not around to see the result of that. Nor was Isaac, nor was Jacob, and nor Joseph. But the decision that you make today in your life is going to impact those who stand around you this morning.